so I guess my first question is uh, to each of you. Um, what's the secret to success? How can a business that is in retail or touching retail, um, you know, make it in circumstances where there seems to be so many trends going against it? Um, maybe I'll start with, with Rusla. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Um, look, it, it all comes back to the customer. Like, no matter what type of retailer you operate, if you don't have customers, you're going out of business. So it all comes back to what are your customers thinking? What are they wanting? What makes them happy? And finding ways to deliver that. And you just have to be absolutely customer obsessed. You have to know exactly what your customers are thinking, what they're happy with, what they're not happy with, what are the products that they're after. Collect as much data as you can. Fix the parts of the business that need improving. Do more of the stuff that they really like. And just that constant culture within your organization to stay uh, absolutely customer obsessed because uh, that's what keeps the retailer in business. We, yes, we've got lots of stakeholders and we've got our team members and we've got our shareholders and all of that, but without your customers and their loyalty, all of that falls apart. So it's very important uh, as a business to know what your competitive advantage is, how it benefits your customers and um, keep your finger on the pulse. And is the inference that, you know, that there's a great deal of the retail sector where they've forgotten that or they don't have the requisite degree of focus on the customer? A hundred percent. And it's, you know, you often hear, you know, is a bricks and mortar versus online and, and all of this. And it's we'll the, that. the thing that's come along with online um, that does better is very often the online players do know their customer very well and know how to leverage the data and information and being able to serve their customers. But uh, the brilliant businesses, no matter whether it's bricks and mortar or online are doing well, and the poor businesses are doing poorly, no matter if it's uh, bricks and mortar or online, because they're not, they're not feeling their customer, they're not uh, understanding what their customers want and differentiating themselves enough. So there's plenty of, plenty of businesses, no matter if you're online or offline, that are doing well and plenty that are doing poorly in both, in both sectors. Joe, interested in your thoughts? Well, I just want to take what Ruslan said and say the same, but since I can't say that, because it is all about the customer, and that was the first thought bubble that came to mind. I'd say that as the only bricks and mortar originator in this group, you know, if you think back to when I started, retail was much more transactional. You know, retailers had the advantage of customers having to come physically to your store. And therefore, if the barriers weren't too annoying, then they'd probably transact with you. And it was a transaction. They'd pay for their goods and they'd leave. And I do think digital has turned that on its head and has put control firmly back with the customer where it should be. And so I think that means the whole industry, as Ruslan says, whether you're bricks and mortar or online, needs to um, really reframe how it focuses on the customer. And unfortunately, I think bricks and mortar retailers have had further to go in coming up that learning curve. I would say that for a retailer to be successful, um, yes, you have to have a differentiated offer. And I, I just take Mecca's, because everyone would say, oh, that's the product, right? And I would actually say, well, no, I think it's actually what we call the Mecca army, our team. And yes, every other retailer has the team, but we spend more than double everybody else on the, the team members in store. And we spend over triple the average on education. And so I would say that's actually the USP for us. And Russell, you actually talked about USP being a critical thing. And another thing I'd say is, once you have that laser-like focus on the customer, it is what do you do incrementally to continue to surprise and delight them and try and fail and fail fast, fail forward and innovate as you go. And for us, because we've continually done that, we now have over what 3 million customers on our database, which means back to the point on knowing your customer well, 
we've had to act more and more like a technology player and we're not that good at it. So I'm not, I'm not claiming any sort of, you know, Russell or Larry's uh, glory here, but you know, it's the data and the analytics that are just becoming increasingly important. And so it's not only knowing your customer and intuitively understanding what they want, but it's actually knowing each customer and being able to personalize to them. But I think it's going to be critical to continued success because being successful as a retailer is ephemeral. It's like sand going through your hands every single day. You've got to just re-scoop up the sand and, and make sure that you're uh, every day obsessing to Russell's point about the customer. And I'll finish there. No, thank you. And, and Larry, I suppose, same question to you, but I suppose your, your viewpoint might be um, unique in, in the sense that, you know, you are directly interacting with and your platform is sort of facilitating commerce through the full spectrum of retailers. Um, and so, you know, any other insights that, that you would want to add to that bit of the conversation? I think, um, I think maybe uh, to extend, all the key points have been made. I think they're, they're, pretty, they're pretty good, but um, it's also easier saying, like everyone says they're customer first and it's really easy to say that. But I think what you've heard now is if you can actually architect that inside the, it's what's happening under the hood of the, of the, the surface of the, you know, the water, actually what's happening inside the company. How are they digesting information? That's the, you know, the, the quantitative data. How are they researching and talking to their customers? How are teams being developed so they can respond quickly to that? And I think that's, that's probably the biggest problem is that a lot of the companies aren't architected properly under the hood to, to be customer first. And you know, I'd, I'd even say as a Zip example, we, we started out with a, a product, a good product market fit and we claim to be customer first, but it probably took us five years to really start to build into the organization a true mentality around continual research. Um, and all these things that have happened during COVID had already started beforehand. So it's really, you know, it's just accelerated a lot of these trends. The data would have told you that, the, the research would have told you that, and the ability to come up with new product ideas, test them, see if that works, you know, accelerate that. Uh, so I think it comes down to a lot, the organization and being able to ingrain that into the business. And then you can withstand a lot of these shocks and changes that are that are happening. Mm. So, so, I mean, you know, really everyone in answering the question sort of um, pointed to uh, online, offline, bricks and mortar. So, so maybe a question that sort of um, hones in there a little bit. Uh, a, few, a few bits to this, to this question. Um, first of all, I think one of the themes that's been noticeable during the course of 2020 with COVID is there's sort of been a, a very pronounced shift to online. Um, in terms of the way customers are in, engaging with, with retail. Um, so I suppose the first bit to the question is, you know, how everyone sees that change? Is that temporary? Is it permanent? Or, you know, to what degree is it, is it those two things? But, but then I guess sort of the broader question is, you know, some of the things that we were starting to see in bricks and mortar retail um, pre-COVID were, uh, you know, um, endeavours by the bricks and mortar retailers to sort of deliver more experiential um, opportunities for their customers. You know, that was a big focus. There was a lot of talk and actually a lot of activity, but not necessarily a lot of certainty about, you know, what that was going to look like and, 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 you know, how, you know, the shops that are in malls were going to change and how that mix was going to change. Um, so, you know, I suppose my, what's my general question? My general question is, um, how do you see sort of online versus offline? What's the current state? Where's it going? How do you see that playing out over the next little while? Um, I don't know, Larry, maybe I'll start with you this time. <laughs> yeah, uh, yes, yeah, so I think, I mean, some of these trends that we're talking to are about meeting the customer. And I think whether it's, you know, the online offline split is actually much, much broader it's meet the customer where the customer is or where the customer wants. So the trends that we were seeing beforehand, obviously we're in the payment space, so payment choice. Um, and uh, you know, if you look at Ruslan's checkout, he's got a great array of payment choice, meeting the needs of the customers who have all the different methods. The other big theme is fulfillment choice. So am I at home? Um, do I want it? Am I happy for it to come in two days? Do I want it to door dash it today and get it in, in an hour? Am I at work? Um, you know, am I 
walking past uh, a Westfield and want to click and click and collect. So really, um, or am I, you know, am I um, filling up at the um, petrol pump and I, I don't, I don't want to walk into um, walk into the service station because I have kids, kids in the car. So really it's about catering for the needs of, of customers. And I think that's really what we've seen. And that's what we've seen accelerate in those businesses that, that have been able to adapt to fulfillment choice and, and payment choice um, has been, has been the, the uh, really the way to think about it from, from my perspective. Mm, interesting. And, and Joe, how's that sort of played out for you this year? And then what's your perspective on where we're going? Again, I, I think this point, you know, sort of I say you know, omni-channel, but I think a much less geeky way of saying that is actually just meeting the customer where they are and, and really giving them everything they want. And again, as the only bricks and mortar retailer, I like to think that we had already really jumped um, you know, with real vim and vigor into this experiential space. And we'd already spoken with all the landlords to say, we're going to be dedicating 30% of our space in store into these different experiences. I think what COVID's done, I think it's a really good example, is where we've said, we've had to take a step back and go, okay, how do we take this concept and now this physical concept that we've come up with all these in-store experiences and how do we put them online back to you know, meet the customer where they are. And when we were all forced to be digitally um, interactive, that allowed us to introduce things like, instead of the in-store customer experience physically in the store, we provided virtual platforms so that you could talk to team members virtually. Then instead of having masterclasses where you'd turn up in store, we would have them virtually um, through Mecca TV, which we launched. And now that we are able to go back into store, I think the key trick is going to be how do you bring physical and virtual together? And so one example of that is where we get, for example, a brand founder and they will do the service in store at the Mecca lab to eight people, we film it we show it on all of the different virtual platforms we have and we beam it into all the other physical beauty labs that we have around the country. And I think that we're just going to see so much more of this where again, um, retailers use their USP in our um, instance, that's the team members. And so how can we bring these team members online with these virtual services? And secondly, if we have experiences, how do we make sure customers can access them, not just physically? And I think we're all going to have to absolutely obsess about how we bring um, uh, retailing experiences to life on all the different channels. And, and Ruslan, you know, to you, I suppose, um, how were you thinking about sort of those endeavours on the part of offline retail to sort of, you know, provide that richer experience? You know, I, I, I'll assert for the sake of argument that that's something that, you know, online can't provide. And even if, as Joe says, there are ways to sort of um, try to bridge the gap, it, it's not the same as touching and feeling something. So, I mean, how do you, how do you think about those issues? Yeah, 100%. And, you know, each business model has to play to its strengths. And the whole experiential side of things is something that, online will never be able to do as well as bricks and mortar. So, you know, when you walk into an espresso store and you can smell the aromas of the various coffees and they let you try some different ones, like, well, never say never, but technology has got a long way to go before we can replicate that at your laptop. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it, is, it is what bricks and mortar retailers should be doing. And they're the ones where when you walk past their stores, you see them packed. Like no matter how poorly um, headlines say retail is doing or bricks and mortar retail is doing, walk past an Apple store, it's completely packed. Um, and yeah, so, so they're the things. Like obviously in an online environment, we've got other advantages. Um, and it sort of comes back to, you know, you were saying, well, what's going to happen in the future because of this disruption? And there's no doubt that COVID is a disruption. And there will come a time very shortly where there's no COVID or COVID isn't um, 
a threat. But the big difference is what happens after the disruption. Now, in a business that's not digital savvy, like um, say for instance, there was a roadblock near your house and you're driving home, you had to take a different road that you never take. You see a cool looking shop with a cool item in the window, you pull over, walk in, buy the item, jump back in your car and drive off. Great. A disruption caused that shop to have a customer, mm. but that shop has no way to contact you again. In the online environment, the disruption has caused businesses like Kogan to speak to way more customers that we haven't spoken to before, to build a relationship with them, to start building a profile on them. Each time they visit our store now, we know what they like and what they don't like and what things to show on the homepage. We know what promotions they like seeing, what they like opening and so on. And so now we get to build that relationship and convert on it um, no matter what the future holds and no matter when uh, COVID is resolved. So that's an advantage of an online business in our environment is the ability to customize and treat every person like an individual. So Imagine a bricks and mortar store that got to rearrange their entire store for each customer that walked in. That's what an online store is able to do. So yes, but we can't do the experiences that Joe was talking about. So everyone's got to play to their strengths. And, and that... Ruslan, the, the shift you've seen this year, sorry, apologies. Uh, the shift you've seen, you know, that we've seen this year in terms of the proportion of overall retail sales going online, how much of that do you think is going to be permanent? Well, it's, it'll be on a business by business um, uh, case. Like from our perspective, we have been building out our skills to be able to use information and data and build relationships with customers digitally and remarket to them and show the right product to the right person at the right time. Like we, yeah. we've, you know, that's, that's our DNA. We often joke that we're a statistics business masquerading as an e-commerce company. Now, we, we back ourselves to not lose customers. And you've seen, you've seen that through our numbers over, over many years and our customer numbers. Um, so we really like the position that we're in. What, what it's going to mean for other e-commerce operators, well, it's, it's theirs to lose. And Larry, I know you wanted to say something, but as the bricks and mortar flag bearer in this, I just have to also say, interestingly, you know, because Australia hasn't been the tale of one country or even two cities, it really has been you know, multiple different states operating very differently, depending on how COVID has hit them. And we've really seen that in the performance of the different states. But the minute our stores reopened, back in late April, I cannot tell you how customers flocked back to stores, mm. wanting that visceral experience that they get in stores and having that cup filling moment. And even in Victoria, you know, four months to get used to a completely different way of um, experiencing retail, they have flocked back to stores. I think the challenge for bricks and mortar retailers is how do we take the one advantage we have with this experiential platform, but also take all the learnings that, thank you, Ruslan, um, you know, uh, operators like you provide in terms of how it is a statistics business, how it is all about the data, and how do we try and take all those learnings that we can into our online experience and marry the two together. But I am saying, and maybe, you know, I'll be proven wrong, but hopefully not, um, that I think everyone who is talking of absolute doom and gloom and destruction of bricks and mortar retailer, retailers, I think that's premature. And the last thing I'll say is when you talk about customer acquisition, 80% of our customers, of our new customers still come to us through our physical stores. So, uh, you know, from a customer acquisition point of view. Anyway, so I'll stop on that. It, but it, my plan. Retailers will do poorly. Um, whether they're online or offline is, I think, you know, the message that people are saying. Sorry, Larry. Yeah, I think the word is uh, fidgetal. And that's, I think, the really exciting thing that we're starting to see here is when you go into a restaurant now or you go into a store, you have to QR and you've got to put your name in. So, you know, if, if, digi if physical can absorb the digital, which there's a lot of tooling now that's coming through now as everything's becoming digitised, and we're all, I agree with Joe, 
we're all social creatures. I mean, those that are the introverted introverts are probably having a great time, but uh, all the other variants want to be cruising through Westfield and other stores because we're, we're kind of social creatures. So hopefully we start to see the digitization of the physical world and then we're cooking with gas. Yeah. Um, I want to go in a different direction for a moment, um, because in addition to, you know, all three of you having um, built businesses in the retail space, all three of you have built businesses. Yeah, you're entrepreneurs who've built, you know, um, really great businesses, great companies from the ground up. So I had a few things I wanted to sort of put to you, to all of you in that regard. Um, I suppose a general question about um, you know, your perspectives on how Australia supports, reacts to, um, encourages, deals with entrepreneurs. I'm certainly interested in hearing, you know, your stories on, in, in that regard. But also perhaps in a more forward-looking sense, you know, you're all people who've started businesses, as I said, from the ground up, you know, from, from nothing, you've built something very large. But in different ways, you, you've all arrived at, you know, the point where you're no longer the little, you know, scrappy entrepreneur and, and you're now, you're, you're now establishment businesses, really big businesses, um, which, you know, puts you in a totally different place in a competition sense, in a market sense. But I'm actually also interested in, in how you see that in a sort of, in a cultural sense or in an internal sense, you know, how do you feel? How does your, how do your companies feel or, what feeling are you, you know, still injecting into uh, your DNA, as, as Ruslan put it, um, in the way you're approaching that? So, um, Joe, I think it's your turn to go first. Why don't, why don't I start with you? Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to flip the question and start with the last piece, which is how do we, in effect, stay lean, mean, hungry, and acting as the challenger, as opposed to the big, incumbent and I, I look I think that's a really good question and something that um, I think about a lot you know, I think in some ways it's as simple as um, keeping that entrepreneurial spirit through the whole business in terms of structure um, uh, devolving responsibilities to the different groups and having um, an approach which really encourages people to take responsibility, to accept um, mistakes as a learning. We talk about failing fast, failing forward. We talk about sharing those learnings. So if one of us has to have an expensive um, um, learning, then can we just have one across the company and can we share it so that we don't all have to go through the same university degree on not winning at something, that would be great. And so I think that if you give people responsibility, if you give them the platform, if you give them clear um, and very uh, ambitious targets to go after, then I think that helps build a very entrepreneurial spirit. And I think COVID is a very good example of that. If I think about how the team operated literally within the first few days of the COVID drumbeat happening, we moved into incredibly agile pods and each area went off and dealt with particular areas of the business. And the amount that was achieved during that time made us sit back after those first really hairy few months and go, we love this. How do we make sure that we keep this level of agility and speed and how do we never get to the point where there is so much process in place that we um, sort of put super glue into the mix? So, and I do think that comes from the top. I do think it comes from how you um, construct your leadership team and then the ELT below that and the amount of autonomy you give people with the clear direction. You know, and I'm, this may sound corny, what's your BHAG? What are you going after? Who's responsible for what? Go for it and let's all celebrate the wins and let's all commiserate together on the lot, you know, on, on, on yeah. things that don't win. So that's one thing I will say. The other thing is I think that one of Mecca's mantras is we are the company of change. And it means that we 
you know, it's boring, but it is just incremental improvement. It's what we call it logical incrementalism. So it's not the swashbuckling stuff of we're doing these huge, you know, it's the Jim Collins approach of bullets to cannonballs. We try, you know, we calibrate, we do small bets at small cost, at small um, uh, sort of impact on the business, work them out really quickly and then decide what are we going after in a really big way. So that's how I'd say how we're different from the major incumbents. And then look, I find Australia and New Zealand very supportive places in which to do business. There's um, you know, clear regulation, there's good economy, there's low unemployment or has been up until COVID and it's incredibly stable. So from that point of view, I found it um, super encouraging. I, I would sort of, you know, council culture, I feel like I'm hogging the space now as I really go into my group. So I'll just say, I think council, you know, that council culture that is emerging as a form of criticism that isn't necessarily even through the traditional um, platforms, but more, uh, you know, armchair warriors on social media, I think is an emerging problem that um, is going to become a bigger issue, but... Not unique to Australia though? No, not unique to Australia at all, mm. global. So Larry, what do you reckon? Uh, are you now a tall poppy? Are you are sort of experiencing, you know, what goes along with that? Um, yeah, look, I think uh, we are, I mean, if you kind of go back to, um, you know the the kind of the, the fabric of the organization as well i think there's a lot of parallels to to what joe said um also a fan of jim collins we've, we've used it you know in, in different forms um and also having been having worked at corporations i just know the pain that we've seen there how people feel when they come to work how they're afraid to speak um and those things is a great like those learnings are great because they really help you think about how you how you architect the business and um what, what, you know, tying the two together, what, what pains me is that the bigger you get, the more credible people think that you are. This sort of, this sort of you know, this, uh, they must be bigger, they must know what they're doing, the kind of moral hazard problem when normally it's the exact same people that were running it seven years ago. Um, and whether you're trying to raise $170,000 or $100 million, I can tell you the 170 grand was 50 times harder. And, and it really shouldn't be, right? So, um, there's the uh, there's how people um, kind of perceive perceive is, is really interesting, but you know we have a similar approach to um, the business, and regardless of how big it gets, you've got to stay true to those things. It does get harder as it gets bigger, without question. So it kind of forces you to go back to um, those key principles. But our, our purpose is the freedom to to own it. Obviously, we, we let customers own the experience, the moment, their well being, but also how we architect the organisation where you give mm. people the freedom. They have the accountability back to you. And we have a thing called zip back, which is, you know, fast, fair um, feedback. And as long as people can incrementally, you know, I think Joe had a much more fancy term for it, can listen, that self-awareness, level up and keep going. And everyone does that a little bit, um, then you'll get better over, over time. Uh, and, and you have to really codify some, some of these principles. So we're actually going through, you know, we've got half our exec teams brand new, um, there's lots of storming going on, we're going global. And so it, it forces you to be even more militant in, in how you codify so that you can, you can build an organ organization that, um, that can adapt, can, can continuously change. Um, and then to flip it to the first part of your original question, you know, if I kind of look back on our, our journey, I would say that America has been a lot better in dealing with start, like big companies yeah. will do deals with small startups. But I would say if I reflect on the last seven years, I do feel it's changed a lot, right? The money coming into the private sector, willing to give it a go. The tech that's being built here is, 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 is a lot better as well. So I think we've seen a lot more, a lot of encouragement in, in terms of supporting entrepreneurs, both, both the funding side as well as, um, but still a, a long way to go. And until a lot of the big corporations, uh, the leadership team changes, uh, you know, and you're starting to see that happen. You're actually starting to see a lot of change happening through the ranks. So big corporates will, over time, I think, get get a lot better um, and, and help help support the, uh, the startup community. Mm, that's really interesting. I, I mean, wh one thing that I remember Paul and Andrew Bassett often saying, not in a retail sense, obviously, in relation to Seek, was, you know, they felt one of the ingredients to 
you know, riding that journey from entrepreneur to, you know, to establishment was maintaining just the right amount of paranoia. <laughs> and Ruslan, it would really appreciate your thoughts. Yeah, look, so it is something that has always been on the mind of myself and the leadership team in the business. It's, you know, we now do by about... Um, 12.05 a.m., we now do more sales than we did in our entire first year. So wow. um, in, that, in that one day. So the, the business has had huge growth um, through that period. And it's really important to maintain that culture because it's really easy to maintain that entrepreneurial culture within an organization when it's two, five, seven, 12 team members, 25. But well, once the business grows and grows, it gets harder and harder. And one of the ways we've done it is our internal mantra um, has for over 10 years now been, there is always a better way. So no one is allowed to enter the meeting with the preconceived mindset that the problem is solved. We don't need to change anything. Right. So, so that's a, that's a, that, that's one of the key uh, one of the key elements for us is that everyone's allowed to question every decision and every problem we've solved. Yes, we may have solved it for now, but there's a better way to solve it. And each time we meet, each time we enter a discussion, it should be under the assumption that we have a solution for everything, but not the best solution. And everything is up for grabs. Everything's allowed to be challenged. And no matter whether you were the inventor of this process or that process or that solution, um, you, you play the facts and, and let's keep fighting for something better. The other one is that I think that um, there's always a lot of buzzwords associated with culture and a lot of organizations will get a few, few buzzwords and they'll engrave them um, you know, in their foyer and they'll say, look, the, that's our culture. I think uh, Enron's was honesty and integrity. Um, so they're, they're, just, they're just meaningless words that people put up around their, around their organization. The true culture of any organization is who you hire, fire and promote. And that is where what we dedicate our effort to, that, you know, we, we want to make sure that we spend a lot of time and effort always searching for the best candidates, interviewing, testing, making sure um, that, you know, it's the people that don't work in our organizations are the people who want to hold a few meetings to discuss what meetings we need to have in the future. Um, you know, it, we're a get it done kind of organization. And you can often sense that in an interview, we said we talk, we go into detail about everything and we go into detail with testing. We want to do that well. We want to uh, then ensure that we acknowledge excellent performers and have them rise through our meritocracy very quickly. Um, and that's another one. And anytime there is somebody who's not a who's not that well suited to our organization, we have to do ourselves the favor and them the favor of moving on very quickly because mm -hmm. that person could be achieving a lot more somewhere else and is dragging us down as well. So it's a win-win to move them on, uh, move them on very quickly. So I think getting those things right, hiring mm -hmm. well, firing quickly and promoting your best talent is really important to nurturing the culture and to keep things entrepreneurial. Yeah, I mean, what's clear from all three of you and the way you responded to that question and all the questions, but it's just, there's no laurel resting, right? There's, you know, there's this continued spirit of what I'd call bravery that says, you know, um, <laughs> when we're not even nearly sort of satisfied yet. We're not nearly, there's still that sort of clear ambition that comes through in in the way you talk about your businesses, which is which is really inspiring. Um, so I'm going to stop us, well, uh, um, coming up with the questions now, and maybe now we'll turn to some questions from the audience. So there's there's one here on the Q and A function, which I'll which I'll read out. But um, if if others who are participating uh, want to ask questions, just type it into the the Q and A function, and um, it would be great to get um, to get those done. So this question is from Ellie Osbom, and it's a question for Ruslan. 
Um, your business can probably operate well under work from home conditions. Um, what's your view on work from home, on going back to the office and, and what the future holds in that regard? Well, yeah, look, our business started by working from home. It started by working from a garage, actually. So um, all of our systems are cloud-based and we were one of the you first... You and Jeff companies. Bezos. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> but, except my, mine was in Brooklyn Avenue in Caulfield. Um, it's probably a slightly smaller garage. Um, but it was... It was something we were able to do and something we were able to do uh, very, very um, quickly. And we can function and we get the job done. But I miss being in the office. Like a video call is an upgraded phone call. It's not a replacement for an in-person interaction. And, um, you know, like everyone's always having a great day in a video call. When we're in the office, I can walk around and see who's having a good day, who's having a bad day. You can, you can have those one or two minute quick incidental chats about some challenges that are going on or, you know, explaining to someone how bad their footy team is. Yeah, you're not going to schedule a, a, you know, two and a half minute video call to explain to someone um, how much you don't like their footy team. Um, so you miss out on a lot of that. And I especially, you know, am concerned for a lot of the junior staff because all those things that they get to pick up in an office environment and seeing how the more senior team members conduct themselves or how they handle phone calls or, you know, all, all of these, all of these sort of interactions. So personally, Yes, we are completely functional from home and um, it, it's great to know that we can do this and it's great to know that um, we've been able to, you know, handle a few curveballs and work through the disruptions. But personally, I, I miss our team. I miss getting into the office. I miss having heated discussions um, around solving problems and debating things and discussing it and just all of that con contact with our team. I, I, can't wait to get back. Um, next question is for Joe, and it's a question from Daniel Agostinelli from Ascent. Um, the question is, Joe, do you think that bigger footprint stores are the future? I think that's a really good question. And I think that we're really, we're asked a lot of questions around what is the store of the future? And are you doing more? Are you doing less? And you know, has COVID impacted this? What I would say is back to point number one, meeting the needs of the customer as and when and how they want it. I actually think that we will continue with this mix of stores. So we have these small high street stores that during this whole period of COVID in you know, the last six months have just seen exponential you know, um, uh, attendance or you know um, customer traffic because people aren't wanting to go into the CBDs, for example. So I think that there's definitely a place for those high street smaller stores and the sense of intimacy that they give. In terms of giving this really big experiential experience that we're talking about, we've also, you know, we've launched a 600 square meter store in High Point, which has smashed every, or did smash every expectation prior to COVID. And again, that gave us the confidence to now, um, and yes, we did sign the lease before COVID because would we have been courage, courageous enough to sign it post COVID, <laughs> big question. But we are now launching the biggest beauty store in the Southern hemisphere on the what was busiest corner of George Street and Pitt Street in Sydney in um, the, at the end of November. So later this month, and it's going to be three floors. And again, it's going to have uh, what, 400 square meters dedicated to services so we are going all out with how far can we push the boat on this and uh, based on what we've learned so far so our large format stores the future I think that I'll let you know how big we can go and still have it be um, uh, you know workable but we're gunning for 1,200 square meters now but I'd say that we still have stores that are 120 square meters do I see those continuing? Yes. So I think all right. stores are still relevant, depending on what the customer wants. Thank you. Um, next question is for Larry from Anonymous. Um, 
how do you see the competitive landscape for buy now, pay later companies? Um, how do you differentiate? Do you think it's going to be a winner take all sector? Um, or, and is consolidation and or failure inevitable? Thank you, uh, Mrs. or Mr. Anonymous. Um, feels like an investor question, right? It doesn't feel like the right place for this. Uh, competition. I just read it out, Larry. I know, I know. Um, I think, yeah, yeah, we should just pack up and, uh, and go home when we see competition. Um, I think, look, we're, we're a big fan of competition. I think it's raised the bar. Um, you know, we, we would say Afterpay has been gr great for Zip, right? You know, and, uh, and, and uh, so healthy competition is great. But under the hood, all businesses are very, very different as, as well. And I think we've kind of spoken about that here today. What's the culture like under the hood of the, uh, under the, hood of the business? And that's why for me, it's about that culture and way of working um, that will deliver our future. Because I can tell you now, the product set that everyone has today is not the product, it's not the widget that we're going to have in, in uh, four years' time. Uh, so we are, you know, Zip, Zip is building a, a wallet strategy for consumers. And um, there is a lot of, you, you have to, I think Joe spoke about differentiation. I think that is absolutely important, particularly in concentrated, smaller um, economic ecosystems like Australia. And you know we have we have good good differentiation here, uh, and uh, and we're going global as well. But yeah, competition is healthy, and it forces you to think. You know, Ruslan spoke about nobody knows anything, right? You can, and particularly founder-led businesses, I think it's great to say that because let new people who come into the business question the why, what what you do, and that and that culture um, helps build uh, an organisation that can withstand and uh, and deliver. So. You know, competition is healthy and uh, good luck to the industry. Okay, so um, the next question is from Megan Gross. And Megan uh, what, asked a question about COVID. So, you know, there's been a lot of commentary about um, the challenges that COVID has um, posed for retailers. Uh, and a question to all the panelists, um, what opportunities do you see in the, in the post COVID landscape? For retailers, Ruslan. Well, look for for businesses like us. There's a huge opportunity in the fact that through this period, there's been a huge acceleration in e-commerce take up and a huge acceleration in our new customer numbers. So uh, we've built relationships with more customers or with more customers in the last nine months than any other prior nine month period uh, in the business. And our new cu customer numbers are growing very quickly. We've got an opportunity to uh, continue to grow that relationship and to be able to service those customers and to be able to use the scale that our business is gaining through this period uh, to improve, improve the offering on our site and so on. So it's a, from a business perspective, there's there's that opportunity, but I also think that um, from a in the wider business environment, it's uh, it's a case of um, necessity is the mother of invention. Like, just have a look around what's happening in the food space and the food delivery space and the way that cafes and restaurants uh, have adapted. And I think that um, when you look out a few years, some of the greatest businesses that will you know, really rise to prominence over the next few years would have been started during this period uh, because, because, yeah, we are living in a very challenging time and um, humans are amazing. We solve all problems that come our way. And Joe, I mean, you know, you said before uh, how, you know, there was this palpable um, desire on the part of your customers to get back in store as soon as they were able to. Any other thoughts on the, the opportunities in a post-COVID world? May it come soon? Look, I, I'm with Ruslan on this. I think that the opportunities that come out of COVID are endless, and I think we are just at the beginning of it, both in terms of what we can do within our own remit, but also around us so much will change that we will be able to leverage with our customers and team members but if I just think about where we are now versus where we are nine months ago both for our customers and for our team members there have been some material differences that we will now 
um, adopt. And I've talked somewhat about customer stuff. I just talk about team members. You know, we launched a month after um, uh, COVID started, Mechaversity, where we took all of our education and I could talk to you forever about education. And the one thing I did say was that we spend more than three times the average. We put all of that into a Mechaversity online platform. And in the time that we've been closed, over 120,000 hours have been completed by team members. Um, you know, we had O week and we've got majors and we've got minors and we've got people who now will go back into store or who have gone back into store at a completely different level of understanding of both um, product and there's leadership courses, so leadership. So I think that it will materially change the abilities of our team to meet the needs of the customer. And that's just one example. And the second example, and you know, Larry talked about Jim Collins, you know, for our media conference, we actually had the whole thing virtually, which meant that we didn't need to bring 400 people together in Melbourne. And so even though it was the middle of COVID and we were feeling, you know, a little bit um, lean and mean, we dreamt up and said, what's the one thing we could give our team members that would mean a huge amount to them? And since we have been banging on about good to great and Jim Collins for 23 years, we actually, organized for him to do a session. So he was with Mecca for two hours and you know it was all about Mecca and we've now cut all of that up into 10 little lessons which has now been uploaded onto Mechaversity. But that just gives you one example of, because I could talk forever about what it means for the customers, but having talked somewhat about that, I just think that gives you one example of how the opportunities that come from this and how long lasting they can be both within our remit but also in the same way we're adapting, Russell and Larry and everybody else is, and we will all benefit from the creativity that comes from this time. Okay. Thanks. Um, another anonymous question. Um, so before, I'll, I'm, I'm gonna preempt the anonymous question by saying that at least in relation to Larry, you know, I think one of the stories of the last 12 months has been you, know, you taking the success that you built in Australia and taking that overseas. So the question's actually about Australian retail generally and opportunities overseas. You know, one of the themes that um, the questioner uh, points to is that, you know, there's been, there have been a lot of great Australian companies, particularly great Australian companies that have started in the last you know, couple of decades, like Seek and Car Sales, who've seen one of their paths to growth as being to sort of take their business, their value proposition um, overseas in some way. I'd add Larry to that list and Zip. Um, so question to Joe and Ruslan, you know, is, is that a path that you think is, well, available slash profitable for, you know, Australian retail companies such as yourselves, um, you know, or, you know, is your, is your sort of deep local expertise sort of a key, a key part of your um, unique selling proposition? Yeah. Um Look, from our perspective, there's definitely that opportunity, the amount of intellectual property that we've built up around um, sourcing and our exclusive brands business and our marketplace and how all of that operates. And uh, there, there's, definitely, there's definitely opportunities there. The thing is, it's not a focus for our business in the short term because while we've done fairly well, if you just look at the scale of things, we're doing about a billion dollars of gross sales in an e-commerce market that's around $30 billion in Australia. So mm. you know, as well as we're doing, we're 3% or so of e-commerce in Australia. Mm. And e-commerce is about 10% of retail. So we're about 0.3% of retail. So the Australian e-commerce market is significantly behind where um, other countries like that, that are more developed, like the US or the UK or Germany are, um, you know, even China, you look, you look at those other more developed markets, and we're talking somewhere in the vicinity of 20 to 30% and growing quickly. Um, so for us, it would be silly to focus uh, somewhere else right now where there's such a huge opportunity here uh, in Australia. And, and that's, that's, what, that's what we're focused Makes on. Right now. We want to get beyond 0.3% of retail. Yeah. Joe, any, anything to add there? Well, 
we're 23 years old so you know um we're at a slightly different <laughs> point because it was never our focus until we got to a certain market share in this market and whilst we certainly see ourselves being able to double in this market we do now look at it and go what other opportunities are there and i've been waving the bricks and mortar and fidgetal um thank you for that word larry but um flag today but what i will say is that the online platform is in itself a bullet that we can now fire where we can go into a market with limited risk before deciding do we move forward with the bricks and mortar strategy and to that end we actually launched with um, Ali Baba's um, Tmall Global so they're um, you know, in China because that's basically 30% of the cosmetics market is Tmall um, and a small part portion of that is Tmall Global. Do we think we're going to win there? No. Do we think that we're going to make money out of that? No. But we know that this is a huge opportunity for us to test the market because we go into it very humbly understanding that we are not the experts but it allows us to try and learn and adapt and to take what is unique about Mecca into the market which in itself is relatively terrifying because we're not discounters and China you know, is, is a market of the greatest traders in the world and you know, uh, we're not going to be playing by their all rules just on that point. So are we going to win or not? We will learn, we will adapt and we will try. But I do think that online has been, or, or digital has given us a fantastic opportunity to, to go into other markets without it being a bet the farm move. Okay, well, I'm conscious of the time. Um, this is fascinating and I have a bunch of more questions that I would have loved to ask. And there are a few from the audience as well that I haven't quite got to, but given the time, I'm gonna uh, hand over to my partner, Gavin Hammerschlag, um, to, to close out with a vote of thanks. You're on, Gav. <laughs> thanks, Jonathan. Um, look, on behalf of my partners and all of the, the guests, um, I'd like to thank Joe, Ruslan and Larry um, for um, spending the time and taking the time to come um, sit with us this afternoon. Um, it's one thing to hear about the disruption that takes place um, in the retail sector, whether it's in the media um, or on the news or whatever it is, but to actually um, sit down with three entrepreneurs like yourselves who are clear leaders, um, both in their field and in Australia um, is a real um, significant opportunity. Um, outstandingly, Joe, you actually um, responded to one of Jonathan's um, questions that um, you're not too sure that you're good at this. Um, and um, just from spending the last um, 45 minutes with each of you, it is pretty clear that um, you are all phenomenal at what you, are do you do and we're excited to continue to work with you and watch you as you um, conquer the Australian retail um, sector and beyond. Um, so once again, our sincere thanks um, and we appreciate um, the time today. Thanks Gav. And thank you again to our panelists. Thanks to all who attended. Um, it was, it, it's a great opportunity for us and, and we're, really, we're really very grateful um, to have had it. Um, and let me close by saying everyone stay safe. I hope you all have a lovely weekend and, uh, and thanks again. Thank you very thanks much, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Darren. Thanks so much. Larry, Ruslan, loved it. Yeah. We should talk another time. Bye. <laughs>